It's Wednesday, January 4th. It's their turn to govern, but can they govern themselves? We start here. For the first time in a century, House members are unable to select a speaker. We may have a battle on the floor, but the battle is for the conference and the country. Lawmakers will vote again today, but it's unclear how this chaos ends. We'll take you to Washington. Hundreds of migrants come ashore in Florida only to find they're on an uninhabitable island. There's no infrastructure in place to sustain human life there. Officials say this is quickly becoming a humanitarian crisis. And instead of attending his opponent's inauguration, he flew off to Florida. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. He uh, was a, a very sore loser in this election. Why some Brazilians are calling Jair Bolsonaro chicken. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Lots of Americans can tell you when a presidential inauguration is supposed to happen. January 20th, mark it on the calendar. And one of the reasons for that specificity is under the Constitution, members of Congress have to get sworn in even earlier, shortly after the new year. You gotta have that first branch of government all set up first thing. Yesterday was supposed to be that day in Washington. Everyone's officially getting to work. So help you God. Thank you. Congratulations, Senators. Thank you. Congratulations. In the Senate, everything went according to plan, but in the House, before you can swear in your members, you first have to agree on a House speaker. Since a simple majority wins, everyone usually knows who that's gonna be, because whichever party controls the House, they decide who they want running the show. This year, that of course is Republicans. But yesterday, for the first time in a hundred years, members of Congress could not decide who would lead them. No persons having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast by surname. A speaker has not been elected. The guy who is the clear choice of most Republicans, Kevin McCarthy from California, could not get all the votes of his Republican colleagues. And because of those holdouts, the House is now in disarray this morning. Let's get it going with our speakership Sherpas, ABC's political director, Rick Klein, and Republican strategist, Sarah Isger, who's an ABC News contributor. Rick, Republicans had like three months to get this ironed out, right? Can, can you just walk me through how this ended up playing out yesterday? This was an absolute meltdown, Brad. Republicans knew they were going to have their work cut out for them. They won a much smaller majority than anyone thought, and they came into the day yesterday knowing they could afford to lose only four votes and keep the speakership. So we may have a battle on the floor, but the battle is for the conference and the country, and that's fine with me. Kevin McCarthy, uh, already chosen by his uh, by his fellow Republicans to be the Republican leader, to be their choice for speaker, he met with, with all of the, the House Republicans yesterday, early in the morning. Uh, the meeting apparently did not go well. This was about a beatdown and a, a simulated union unity in the room, which really doesn't exist. Everything I heard hardened my resolve that this town desperately needs change. And so now here we are being sworn at instead of being sworn in. By no accounts did it go well because he previously conceded he wasn't going to get the votes. There's times we're going to have to argue with our own members if they're looking at for only positions for themselves, not for the country. They go to the House floor for the big ceremonial roll call. No one, no one in this body has worked harder for this Republican majority than Kevin McCarthy. And again, he could afford to lose four votes. He lost 19. He wasn't wow. even close. In fact, it was the Democrat that had the most votes. Today, Madam Clerk, House Democrats are united. <laughs> But neither candidate got got more than 218. So they did it all over again. Uh, Kevin McCarthy hoping that, that just this show, the sheer force of will would prevail. It didn't. Again, he lost 19. So guess what? They tried again. And this time, he lost 20 votes. So his vote going in the wrong direction. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma rise? Move to adjourn until noon tomorrow. Finally, after three votes, five-plus hours, they threw in the towel and decided to start all over again and try it today. Wait, this is... Bonkers, you guys. I'm sorry. So, wait, Sarah Isger, we're used to talking about how with members of Congress, everything's negotiable, right? Throw them a bone. Why are some of these members clearly, like, so, so opposed to him? Well, let's be clear, though. Kevin McCarthy has been throwing out bones like he's a junkyard dog. Uh, that's been <laughs> happening for months. For the last two months, we worked together as a whole conference to develop rules that empower all members. 
but we're not empowering certain members over others. In Last fact, so much so that even if McCarthy pulls this off somehow at noon today, most people think, including me, he won't be speaker for very long because hmm. one of those bones he threw out was to lower the threshold for them to call to replace the speaker. So instead of the majority of the caucus, it can now just be five members. And if you could just imagine what it's like if everything you do has to please all but four members, basically, you're not gonna keep your job for very long. And frankly, your job's gonna be deeply unpleasant while you do have it. There's very little difference between Nancy Pelosi and her California delegation mate that seeks the gavel. The never Kevins, the still uh, holding out folks, what they told him in that meeting uh, now two nights ago was, we don't care if this ends with Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader, being named Speaker of the House. House. In like, fact, we'd rather have him than you, anyone but you. They are truly never Kevins, at least, you know, as of how things were looking last night. I'm not here to participate in some puppet show where we pass a bunch of messaging bills, send them to the Senate, watch them die, fail to use leverage, and don't hold the Biden administration accountable. I don't want to relive the Benghazi experience where it's just theater we're pretending back. to be oversight. Right. And their right. argument for that, by the way, I think is pretty spot on and it gets to a much larger issue that I hope we can talk about because politically for them, it probably is better if Hakeem Jeffries is a speaker. It gives them someone to fight against. Their legislation wasn't going anywhere as backbenchers to the extent they have any legislation. Most of these uh, you know, more junior congressional folks don't even have legislative staff anymore in any traditional sense. They have communication staff because that's how they raise money. That's how they get their name ID up. And if you want to raise money, you're doing it based on on outrage and anger and emotion. That's going to be hard to do when it's your team in power. Much easier to do with Hakeem Jeffries up there. Wait, so, Rick, is it Kevin McCarthy's personality? Is it just the fact that, like, they need someone to hate and he's going to be it? Or is it, like, his principles, his beliefs of some sort? They're like, that's just anathema to us. We can't abide. Yeah, I wouldn't look for principles here. I, I think this has a <laughs> lot more to do with the politics of the Trump era. Even though Donald Trump's behind Kevin McCarthy, most of the folks who are opposing him for speaker are are also behind Donald Trump. They're MAGA folks, and they're, this is basically the, 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 the dog that caught the car type situation now that they're governing. What do they mm. actually stand for? They can talk about some of the procedural things and the integrity of the House and the institution and all those things, but no, this is about not allowing Kevin McCarthy to become House Speaker, and it really is about him as a person far more than it is any of these thresholds that would neuter his very speakership. I rise to nominate the most talented, hardest working member of the Republican conference who just gave gave a speech with more vision than we have ever heard from the alternative, I'm nominating Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan is humble. And that's why you're starting to see people that were actually pretty loyal to McCarthy be the choice of these never McCarthy people. That's why they all coalesced uh, in the first couple of votes around Jim Jordan, who is very much uh, a, a McCarthy supporter. So if he doesn't, are you going to run? No, I want to be chair of judiciary. So that's why there could be an interest in Steve Scalise, his longtime loyal number two. This is about McCarthy, who, by the way, has hardly been a paragon of principle throughout his political career. I mean, this is a guy that has, uh, to, 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 to paraphrase Matt Gates, uh, has sold portions of his soul for more than a decade to try to get this, this exact job. He's the guy that showed up at Mar-a-Lago a few weeks after the election because he recognized how, how strong the Trump wing of the party was. So for all of that to not be enough tells you a lot about how difficult it's going to be to govern with anyone as the speaker of this Republican majority. Hey, you guys, Rick just threw out a couple names here. Sarah, I want to hear your takes on them. So, so Keem Jeffries, you already mentioned, that's the leader of the Democrats. You'd expect him not to get any Republican votes. But Jim Jordan from Ohio, he's like a founding member of the Freedom Caucus. So, like, very much, like, uh, within this sort of far-right coalition. Steve Scalise from Louisiana, I remember he, remember, survived a mass shooting. He's been a big part of Republican leadership for a long time now. But, like, Steve Scalise wasn't getting any votes yesterday. Jim Jordan got, like, 20. You need, like, 218. So how – are these people just going to quietly whittle them away? Or, like, how, how does that end up working? I don't think anyone thinks there's a world where Jim Jordan becomes speaker. Uh, that's okay. not a serious person to put forward in any real sense. Um, it's a protest candidate. I mean, as Rick said, mm. uh, this is more about Kevin McCarthy, the person, than I think it is any overriding principle. I've talked to um, one of these no-voting Republican members and 
and you hear this from all of them, which is this is a trust issue. How can we trust someone who will do anything to get this job? When you're threatened with being kicked off your committees if you're if you don't vote as you're ordered to, we literally had people in there telling us to take orders, and and I can only speak for myself, but I suspect my colleagues here have the same sentiment. I don't take orders from anyone in this town. My orders come from my district and my constituents. They are happier with I think uh, a Scalise compromise candidate. A Elise Stefanik, the number three, also mentioned as potentially a compromise candidate. But you know what I think is more important than who is speaker? Because frankly, in terms of what's actually going to happen in the next two years, none of this matters. Oh, uh, like, like so little's going to get done because Democrats control the Senate, Republicans control the House. It's just one big argument anyway. That's right. But this is about weakening the speaker and frankly, humiliating Kevin McCarthy. But if what's holding up today is simply about a few members who want something that they haven't earned, we can't give the end to that. Republicans have delayed this reckoning for the better part of a decade now. The whole rise of Donald Trump, the whole rise of the Tea Party. There's not big, that big a difference between what you can all call the Tea Party and a, your average conservative Republican. You know, we're against Obamacare. We think taxes are too high. They haven't really had to grapple with this. The Trump era, in a lot of ways, papered over those divisions. Now they have to figure things out in a very real way. And Kevin McCarthy, uh, you, you, you could almost feel bad for the guy for being the, the person that is this stuck in this, except he knew exactly what this was. He mm -hmm. tried to channel these very energies uh, as a, at first as a backbencher and running through candidate recruitment as a young gun a decade ago, along with Paul Ryan and Eric Cantor. We are committed to reforming the way this place works and it's changing the culture of Washington. We have heard them and we're putting the team together to make sure we're able to carry out what they told us. He tried to build this majority and he knew what this majority would look like. So there's a certain uh, almost Shakespearean tilt to the fact that he is the guy that, that is seeing all these chickens come home to roost. And what should have been the easy part, just electing their own leader on day one, that should have been the big day of celebrations and hugs right. and kisses and, and balloons and happiness. It was the opposite for Republicans. It was a disaster of a day. Last question. Who's it going to be, Sarah? If I had to put you on the spot, who's it going to end up being? Oh, gosh. I hate questions like this because <laughs> there's just so much unknown about what's going to happen today. I'm not sure I would have told you that they would have adjourned after three votes. In fact, I know I wouldn't have. Mm. Kevin McCarthy said he was going to force them to you know, vote through the night. But if in that fourth round ballot, they have 20 never Kevin votes, um, then I think you're looking at a Scalise speakership. The fact that you were so tortured over that means Rick is not going to answer this at all. So I'll leave it there. Oh, I'll give you a hot take. I'll, I'll give you a hot take, Brad. The next <laughs> Ooh, House Speaker Rick hot takes. The next House Speaker has not received any votes for House Speaker yet. It's someone that is you know, mm. waiting in the wings, will end up being drafted. You know, whether that's Scalise, whether that's Stefanik, whether it's Patrick McHenry or someone else entirely, is a current member of the House, but I think in all likelihood not someone who's actually gotten votes uh, just yet because I think McCarthy through three rounds of voting has not shown an ability to pick up votes and I think that is the, it can make it potentially just a total non-starter right. uh, and, and I don't think Jim Jordan is, is where they land either. I hate when Rick's hot takes are better than mine, Brad. It really annoys me. <laughs> Quit yeah. having him excellent, on this podcast. Excellent hot takes from everyone here. Uh, Rick Klein, our political director. Sarah Isger, thank you both so much. You bet. Thanks, Brad. Next up on Start Here, once we got the lawmakers sworn in, it's not a given they'll have an immigration plan, but the hundreds of migrants who just washed up in Florida could really use one. We're back in a bit. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. 
Zoo. 200. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. <laughs> that rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. So as lawmakers in Washington were waiting to get sworn in yesterday, leaders at the state level were having no such problems. Ron DeSantis began his second term as Florida governor. Freedom lives here in our great sunshine state of Florida. Proudly describing his state as a place where taxes would remain low, where schools would be free from lesson plans recognizing LGBTQ or black history, and where undocumented immigrants would find little shelter. We will never surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. It would be easy to forget, though, that over the last few days, a small Florida island has been inundated by hundreds of desperate migrants, becoming the latest home to what officials are calling a humanitarian crisis. The difference between this island and most of those other places where migrants are arriving is those other places have multiple buildings and running water between them. ABC's Armando Garcia covers the immigration beat. Armando, like... I hesitate to even call this an island. Like, it, I'm just looking at Google Maps. It looks like a beach on a sandbar that's barely poking up above water. It's got an old Civil War fort on it. H how is this the place where 300 migrants suddenly show up? Brad, that, that's absolutely correct. The first thing we need to know about Dry Tortugas National Park is that it is the very definition of remote. It's about 70 miles west of Key West, Florida, only reachable by seaplane or boat. And it's made up of about seven small, mostly uninhabitable islands. A spokesperson for the Coast Guard covering that region said that there's no infrastructure in place to sustain human life there. So as migrants started landing there over the last weekend, we saw a full-scale effort on behalf of Coast Guard, CBP, DHS, and other entities to remove migrants from that area and get them to safer land. And Brad, I actually spoke to one person who said he was camping over the New Year's holiday at the park when he witnessed several migrant landings. He tweeted out photos that he captured, and he said he'll never forget the shouts of relief and the tears of joy. He was actually there when the park closed, so he was told that he had to leave. The park remains closed. The National Park released a statement saying that they were closing the park for several days because of the resources and space needed to attend to the migrants. They estimated approximately 300 migrants arrived over the weekend. Wait, and so how do these people get here, Armando? Is it like one big boat of people coming from you know, a place like Cuba or something? What? They were coming in several vessels. Uh, and although the National Park did say that the migrants were coming from Cuba, CBP or Coast Guard, they have not confirmed exactly where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. But look, it, I think smugglers will take advantage of any clear day, any opportunity to send migrants on this dangerous trip. And migrants will, take, will do anything to make their lives better for their loved ones, and they will risk their lives to come to the United States. And, and this just shows the desperation of the people willing to get on a boat, traverse dangerous waters to reach any piece of American land, mm. you know, holding on to that glimmer of hope that they can come to this country and hopefully receive asylum. Wow. Okay. And so then the smugglers, you think, are just like, yeah, we said we'd get you to the United States. This is technically the U.S., regardless of whether you'll be safe here or anything. But so, Armando, I'm looking at places like El Paso. Border officials say it's an absolute crisis. These are people that have shown up on foot. We look at Martha's Vineyard in New York City and places where these people have been shipped to. That's a crisis, clearly. Now we look at this area. Border officials call this, guess what, a humanitarian crisis. Are we just going to see more of these types of incidents for the rest of 2023? I will say that in the coming days, I believe we can expect more immigration policies to be announced. I mean, the Biden administration has said themselves that they are still going to prepare for the eventual lift of Title 42, that public health policy that has prevented hundreds of thousands of migrants from petitioning for asylum. We will, of course, the way that we see it, comply with the order and prepare for court's review. Uh, but at the same time, we're advancing our preparations, as I've mentioned, to manage the border in a secure, orderly, and humane way when Title 42 eventually lifts. There's a little bit of uncertainty about how that's going to end up and whether migrants are going to have the opportunity to petition for asylum. But look, there's also a lot of factors at play. People in Cuba are fleeing a dictatorship. People in Haiti, political and civil unrest, violence. So until those 
those root issues are addressed, I think we're going to continue to see these massive groups of migrants uh, reaching the shores or reaching El Paso, reaching any piece of American land uh, to, to hold on to that glimmer of hope. You know, like I said, that the Coast Guard hasn't confirmed where these migrants are coming from yet. Um, but I will say that the Coast Guard has uh, said that they've encountered more than 4,000 Cuban migrants in the water since October. That's more than half the total amount for the entire last fiscal year. So these numbers are absolutely massive. Uh, border communities, local communities are, are struggling to kind of keep up and help with resources and providing first aid to these migrants. And migrants every single day are risking their lives and sometimes losing their lives to reach the United States. All right. Uh, that's Armando Garcia, whose specific beat is immigration and immigration policy. Really thankful for the expertise, Armando. Thanks, Brett. Okay, we're going to take one more quick break. When we come back, I knew Florida was a retirement destination, but I didn't know how many presidents that applied to. One last thing. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. And one last thing. He had lost his race. He was the subject of potential criminal investigations. And he had left his country as divided as ever. So where did he spend his days after that presidential election? Florida, of course. And no, I'm not talking about that president. I'm talking about this one. Quero começar agradecendo os 58 milhões de brasileiros. Jair Bolsonaro, the brash right-wing Brazilian leader, often called the Trump of the tropics, was spotted over the weekend, not even in the same country where his rival was being sworn in. In, but rather at a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Orlando. So Claire, what is Jair Bolsonaro doing at a KFC in Florida? Like, is it impossible to get the extra crispy recipe in Rio? Like, what what is going on here? Right. So Bolsonaro didn't make it a secret that he uh, was a, a very sore loser in this election. I mean, he took days to show his face after he lost. That's ABC's Claire Bauer, who's based in Rio, who said the vibes are remarkably similar between Bolsonaro and Trump himself, with whom he's close. So there were rumors he was going to stay at one of Trump hotels. Instead, he stayed at the home of an MMA fighter who is uh, a friend of his. When Bolsonaro lost a close election to the man they call Lula, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, he refused to accept the results as legitimate. There were concerns about political violence. In fact, some of his most hardline supporters began openly discussing rebellion, camping outside military installations, hoping to inspire a coup. There was a, a guy who was arrested, um, accused of trying to blow up a um, a tanker near where the inauguration was going to take place. He, he was accused of, of, of having plans to, to do this. But there, weren't, there was no coup. Uh, the military said early on, I mean, during the election, that they would not get involved with any attempts to overthrow the results of the election. So unlike America, there was no January 6th. 
For his part, Bolsonaro condemned the bomb plot. And similar to the US, Claire says, the man who took over for him is not necessarily beloved. He was once convicted of corruption. But Lula spends less time openly antagonizing his critics. For people who were tired of political whirlwinds, the last few days felt like a big exhale. But Brazil, like the US, remains intensely divided. There was a sense of relief that perhaps Brazil now could go back to normal. Unfortunately, I think many people here feel there is no longer any normal. That's not where these parallels end, either. Both Trump and Bolsonaro are facing potential criminal investigations that could derail their lives far beyond politics. For Trump, it's a criminal referral about January 6th and questions over his handling of classified documents. For Bolsonaro, it runs from accusations of corruption all the way to responsibility for thousands of COVID deaths. There was a time he claimed vaccines could turn you into a crocodile. So Bolsonaro for four years had immunity as president of Brazil. That now has run out for him. He is no longer immune. He can be charged. What will happen, we don't know. But there are certainly uh, many, many, many investigations that are pending. Now, is that why he ended up flying to Orlando right as a new administration took over? It would appear he's not that concerned. He's since returned to Brazil. But his sons with Italian heritage, who are facing potential investigations themselves, have recently applied themselves for a Italian citizenship. In any case, Claire says, don't expect any resolution to happen soon. There's a famous expression here that uh, acabó in pizza. It means it ended in pizza. It's investigations that don't go anywhere. So will this end in pizza? We don't know. But there are certainly enough charges against him that if they wanted to go after him, they, they could. In other words, whichever democracy you happen to live in, it's always a slow burn start using that phrase like hey you guys were deciding on who was going to be in charge of that new project whatever happened with that oh it ended in pizza just sort of sitting on it for a while more on all these stories at abcnews.com or the abc news app i'm brad milky see you tomorrow at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Big breath. Zen. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to my ranch. Packs should get along like a happy family. People mistake an excited dog for a happy dog. My German just told her, your energy is not healthy. A little more confidence, less nervous talk, better leash work. I could imagine you there, and you're kind of like my spirit guide. I feel like I'm the boss again. Yes, calm, confident. There you go. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Avatar The Way of Water. 
is mind-blowing. You don't know what to expect. Unlike anything you've ever seen. What will audiences see in this film that they've never seen in a movie before? We were competing who was going to hold their breath longer. I made it to three minutes. I think I got to five. Seven minutes and 14 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Into the Deep with Avatar. It was just amazing. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu.